Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. I'm back again with my friend Julie and we're gonna be doing a little bit of a fragrance Q&A today. So in filming the Disney princess and Disney villain videos with Yana, I have had numerous questions uh, because you guys know I'm a fragrance new. I don't know much except for I like things, I don't like things and I now wanna know all the things to know um, and a few of my friends watched the videos, loved the videos and also had questions. So we are going to ask Yana some fragrance new questions and find out what we need to know. So basically any fragrance related, potentially newbie questions, maybe not newbie, but really like anything fragrance related, it's fragrance knowledge day. Okay, so a question I was asked, where are the best places to spray your fragrance? So the best places to spray are the places on your body that emit heat and that are close to your pulse points so that it radiates your fragrance. Okay. So I like to put it, you can put it on your neck. A lot of people like to put it behind their ears. I like to put it like on my like pulse points on my neck. Okay. I like to put it here where they draw blood. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, here on my wrist where the venicles are. Same spot behind your knees. Ah. Yeah, if you want to in the summer, like when you put them behind your knees, you walk by, it leaves a really nice trail because if you're wearing shorts or a skirt and you walk by, you leave a really beautiful trail. And then another spot that I taught you that isn't really a pulse point or anything, but it's the back of the neck mm -hmm. for the same reason that it leaves a really nice trail and it doesn't go in your face as much. But also all over your body but if I'm being conservative with my sprays, I limit it to my pulse points slash like hotter parts of my body. Peppy is reaching for the tripod <laughs> and this camera might go down. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I guess a follow up to that is you're a contact sprayer, right? You spray it on yourself as opposed to in the air and walk through. That's exactly right. I am an, I'm, I'm, I'm against the non-contact spraying. I think it's a waste of fragrance and I hope you guys will agree with me, but it's um, it's really a pity to you know spend such a fortune on fragrances and then when you spray it in the air, like some of it like will dissolve, like you're kind of wasting it. So really you're best off spraying it either on your clothing or on your body directly. I, I'm not a spray and walk through the spray kind of person. No, neither am I. So another question was, which you slightly answered, is is it better to spray on the body on the clothes a mix does that depend on the fragrance itself all very good questions and yes it really does depend so some fragrances i like to spray directly on the skin because a lot of the times a fragrance will smell different on the skin or on your clothing so it really depends how you interact with that fragrance how that fragrance interacts with you sometimes for example there are fragrances that i can spray on my skin that might give me like a physical irritation mm -hmm. like i've had fragrances that i love how they smell but i'll spray it and i'll break out in hives and yes. i don't know what i'm allergic to but i'm like if i want to use this fragrance i have to spray it on clothing only do you also find that sometimes you get a reaction somewhere you sprayed on yourself, but not others? Yeah, yeah. I get that too. Yeah. Okay. It does happen, and it's really hard to pinpoint exactly what the ingredient is, like unless you go for an allergy test. So at that point, if I decide to continue using that fragrance, I'll spray it on the clothing. But in general, like on my day-to-day -day affairs, I, I'm a spray everywhere and kind of go person, so I will spray it on like my post boys, but I'll also give a few sprays on the clothing because that way the fragrance will last longer because it just, it does embed itself into fibers way more than it does onto your skin. Right. After filming the Disney villain video, when we sprayed Womanity upstairs, yeah, it smelled amazing on the shirt and it lasted for like two days on my shirt, but spraying it on the skin, it smelled fishy but it just smelled so good on the clothes. So that, like, that's one fragrance I will never spray on myself. I have to spray on clothes. There you go, like, yeah. it's so different. Like, different fragrances will develop so differently. And I think the best way to test out a fragrance to really know, like, whether you even like it or not is to spray it both ways, on the skin and on clothing. I did cover that in my um, tips on how to test a fragrance video. So you guys can check that one out. So another question I had was, what is the best way to test out a fragrance um, to see if you like it enough to buy. Okay, so before you buy a fragrance in a store, I really, really recommend 
like not buying it at first grabbing it like if you love it grab it and buy it like i would avoid that unless you can return it like if it's a four and you can return it then you're fine but if it's like it's gonna be problematic to return it i like to experience the fragrance a little bit so spray it on your skin sometimes they'll give it to you on a little blotter to take home i always ask them to spray it on my skin like especially now with covid times mm -hmm. you can't take them and spray it yourself but the associates usually can spray it on you okay so i've been able to like go into shops and say can you spray this on me and spray that one fragrance only don't spray one here one here and one here and then try to figure out which one you like go for one and it's hard it's hard and i have such a hard time with it and i do this all the time where i'll spray one here one here and one here but then it's like it's a mixture and you don't know what you're smelling and it smells different in the air than it does on your skin so choose one commit yourself to one wear it on your skin and just for that day experience it if you like how it develops if you like the dry down you'll also get to see how long it lasts so you may love a fragrance but it might only last you half an hour and that fragrance costs you like over a hundred bucks and you're like what did I spend that money on yeah right so it's always best to spray the one spray experience it at least for a day then go and buy it okay That's unless it's a four and you want to return it so to go with the buying of one why do fragrances smell different in a store as opposed to when you're at home? Very good question. This question was torturing me for ages when I was like smelling fragrances in store, then smelling them at home, or like smelling it in a store, then buying it online. And I'm like, why is this different? And then I like kind of figured it out. And the reason for that is because A, in a store, like the ventilation system is completely different than at home, than outside. And there's also like a lot of distracting factors when you're in a store. There's a lot of other people, a lot of other people wearing other smells, a lot of other people that have already sprayed things in the air. So there's all these particles floating around. Like, and if you're at Sephora, let's say Sephora, right? They have all these other products too. Hairsprays, dry shampoos, basically a lot of different smells that could be cross-contaminating your nose holes. Oh, and then the other thing too is you're smelling more than one fragrance on your visit. You're smelling probably five, six, seven fragrances. And like what I like to do, and this is like me in Wonderland, basically, this is like my Wonderland. <laughs> I go and take a handful of blotters at Sephora yeah. and I go, psh, 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 psh. what am I smelling? Probably nothing at that point, Yeah. right? And then if I think that one smells good, do I really know? No. It's like the same thing as like if you're going to try on shoes and you're trying on several different pairs and you're not really walking in them, you're just trying them on, you get confused. Yes. So you really need to dedicate a wearing to a fragrance. So what I would say is if you're going into a store, try not to smell more than three at a time. And that is why fragrances smell different in store than when you take them home. So this one, I think you have spoken to, uh, but it's still one that I get asked now that people know that I've done this show, even though I still don't know completely, is how best to store your fragrances and how long do they generally last? And do like some last better than others, like more expensive ones last longer? I don't know. Oh, I love that you're calling this a show as if we are actually a real you show. You are, you're a show. <laughs> I'm a show. Um, so I do actually find that some fragrances, depending on the quality, do last longer than others. I've had fragrances go bad that were cheaper in a much shorter amount of time than certain expensive ones, but that's not to say that's the golden rule. So how to store them, you wanna choose a cool, dark place so not a bathroom, mm -hmm. um, preferably a closet somewhere in your house that's like a little bit of a cooler room. Some people even go so far as to get a separate like mini fridge for their fragrances. I wouldn't get a mini fridge. I would just like keep them in a dark, cool place and the temperature needs to be even and consistent so it can't fluctuate away from humidity and that's, that's your best bet. And so they could last you decades. Like I have fragrances, like you've smelled my opium. Yep. And the Dior uh, yeah. Poison, yes, that's from the 80s. The other one, I think, is from the 70s. I'm not sure, maybe not, but I'm pretty sure. Like they're they're super old guys. They'll last decades if you store them properly. And sometimes what can happen is the top notes will fade. So when you put it on your skin, it will smell weird. And then after a few minutes, it like it will develop a little bit and it'll start smelling okay. So good quality fragrances may do that. And okay. they won't completely, completely spoil. Like the opium one was like that. I yeah, think. exactly. So that one, like you will apply it and you're like, Ugh, this doesn't really smell like anything. But then in five minutes, it smells like a fragrance finally. So yeah, um, 
they won't like completely get ruined they can last you decades really like they really you can buy vintages right now of like early day chanel fragrances that are still good as long as they've been stored properly right oh and the other thing too is as i learned from one of you viewers that suggested this to me cool. i learned guys that i know <laughs> can you believe it sometimes when a fragrance has gone off or you think it's gone off it could be just the bit that's in the little like atomizer straw and you if you give it like several sprays that part might have been in contact with air and spoiled because of like being oxidized so once you clear that it might still be good like the rest of the juice might still be good but you test it out by like giving it five six seven sprays and then it might still be good so I wish I could remember who told me this, but I learned and thank you, and now I'm spreading your knowledge. Very nice. Wonder if my diesel one's gone bad. It probably is just that. I think your diesel's gone think so. way off because that's also a cheaper one. I know. I have to throw that one out. Ugh. Okay, I feel like this is a, a big one, especially if you're shopping for fragrances. How do you wash off a scent that you've sprayed on yourself that you're not a fan of, or like it's just it's become too much? How do you wash it off? Mm -hmm. This is what we call a scrubber. The fragrance that you don't like, that you need to scrub off yourself, is a scrubber. Okay. <laughs> fragrance terminology. <laughs> so you actually have to scrub it. I have learned that baking soda works absolute wonders. Mm -hmm. The best really technique is like just taking that loofah and like scrubbing those spots, but not so vigorously that like you'll irritate your skin obviously, but I've used baking soda and it actually works really, really well to remove fragrance because it's a deodorizer like you put it in your fridge you put it anywhere that there's a smell you know like to get rid of an odor so i had tried this on my own and there are still certain strong fragrances that it doesn't work for and then i have to do it twice over and like three times over yeah and it'll usually work but sometimes so basically what i do is like let's say it's here so i'll put water and i'll put the baking soda and i'll kind of like go like this okay and i'll let that paste kind of sit for a bit and then i'll um scrub it off like with a loofah and you can use soap as well you can use a mixture but like basically yeah you're gonna need to use some products to get that off and you're gonna have to scrub okay. scrub 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 like just soap and water will not do anything for you okay so be yeah. careful in this in the sense that you spray on yourself yeah don't by no means should you ever for the first time spray a fragrance right here no because then you're gonna have to take a long long shower yeah that's cool. why i like to spray right here because that's the easiest spot to scrub yeah and you wash your hands all the time exactly so, so i feel like i've been victim to this a couple of times because you know being new to the fragrance world i spray a couple sprays on and i go oh i really like this and i'll spray a couple more and i'll think that was one too many sprays <laughs> So my question is, if you spray one, maybe two, too many sprays, is there anything you can do to kind of like diet down a bit? Change your shirt. Okay. Yeah, probably change your clothing. I've done this too. I don't know of a better solution rather than scrubbing a few spots and like washing some of that fragrance off or changing your clothing. But otherwise, once it's on you, it's basically, it's stuck on you until you bathe yourself. Okay. Yeah. So shower or change? I have no magic formula. Shower or change? Yeah. Those, those are magical formulas to me. <laughs> so I've heard the term layering mm -hmm. now. And again, me being someone that I get overwhelmed with all these lovely scents, I sometimes spray a bunch on myself and then I don't know if that's going to be a bad combo. I feel like I generally just smell good, but that just could be because I love everything I spray on myself. But um layering like what do you recommend like similar scents or opposite like how i don't know what's the best way to layer if someone wants to layer okay so it can go either way you can use like complete like polar opposite scents and they could create a really good combo or you could use similar scents and there's really like again there's like there's no magic formula but the thing that i've noticed is like don't layer fragrances or like it doesn't tend to be a good combination when you layer fragrances that each of them have a lot of notes so for example i don't think it would be a good idea to layer angel with tom ford's black orchid because that's a lot of notes yeah and it's just gonna i could be wrong but i think it'll smell like a mess so if you're wanting to come up with like your own like concoction and kind of like signature combo I would stick to fragrances with a smaller note profile and like combine those. So like when I sprayed Gris Dior and Mugler's Angel Aqua Chic, 
That would be good. I felt well, that like smelled. I really think good. that was good because you can take one that has a lot of notes and combine it with one that doesn't, but not two that have a lot. So Greedy or doesn't have too many notes. No. But Angel Aqua Chic I think has I don't know how many it has, but if it's anything like Angel, it has a lot. Maybe it has a little bit less. But anyway, you can take one that has a lot, a lot of notes and layer it with a simpler fragrance and you probably will still be good, but a lot of it is trial and error. Really, like a lot of it is trial and error. Sometimes you want, might want to spray it on paper and see how it smells on paper before you put it yeah. on your skin. I've done that before playing with layering combos and like doing like test strips of all different ones. Oh, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I've heard uh, you and other people mention like a warm fragrance or a winter fragrance versus a summer fragrance. Well, what does that mean? Okay, so seasonal fragrances. This is debatable and a lot of people really don't like the idea of seasonal fragrances but I kind of feel like it's a fact of life. Some fragrances just work better in colder weather, some fragrances work better in warmer weather. So when people refer to winter fragrances or cold weather fragrances, it's usually fragrances with richer notes that are more like packing a punch. So like leathers and amber a lot of the time, um, like heavier scents that could potentially be overwhelming and cloying during the summer because when you mix those heavy scents with like heat and humidity, oh, yeah. it could be overwhelming. Yeah. So a lot of the time, and also very, very sweet scents, usually more f so for a cooler day. Not That's not to say you could never wear them in the summer, but like you have to be a little bit more careful and generally they're more of a cooler weather scent. Maybe spray less in that's the it. summer. Yeah, like Alien I'll still wear in the summer, but I'm not spraying like more than two sprays. Yeah. Right, but then there's uh, summer fragrances, which are kind of the opposite. They're lighter, airier, and they just won't perform in the winter. So they're perfect for when you want a refreshing scent, like citrusy fragrances, lighter florals, things like that, that would suit um, warm weather really well. So that's when you say, it's like a generalized term of like summer, winter, and you can obviously, you know, cross contaminate. <laughs> yeah. Right? You can wear whatever you want, whenever you want, but that's what people mean when they refer to summer or winter fragrances usually heavier or lighter fragrances. Okay, and like a, a kind of a pattern I've been noticing is the darker the juice of the fragrance seems to be like the thicker, like the thicker of the smell that should be worn maybe when it's cooler out. I think that's a really good observation and I actually haven't paid attention to that, but that's a fair point. That makes sense because a lot of those fragrances do have a lot of vanilla and vanilla darkens as it ages, a lot of like resinous notes, like rich, warm, um, I know you're gonna ask me about resins. I am. No, I am. <laughs> Rich, warm notes that a lot of the times they are derived from nature and that do tend to darken a little bit over time or are already darker when you get them. So it does tend to kind of be a trend that a darker juice equals um, a cooler weather fragrance. Okay, so on this word resonance that you've just said that I don't know what it means, could, could you please elaborate? <laughs> so resonance refers to fragrances that contain resins, which are generally um, like products that come from a tree that are usually like sap-like. Okay. And so there's balsams, there's different types of like secretions from trees that solidify that then you get a fragrance out of it. It's like, it's, look, I'm not a chemist, but there's a whole science behind it. You're not? Believe it or not. But there's a lot of different ones. So there's like Elemi resin, there's Tolu balsam, there's Benzwin, there's frankincense, the, oh, yes. the main one. Okay, you've named right? one that I've heard of. Yeah. yeah. So all of these come from like a resin type of material. So you're using that natural kind of material to add fragrance and it usually tends to have a little bit of like a medicinal smell to it. Okay. So yeah, it's always very rich, heavy, and like if you are familiar with frankincense or like, what was the other one that they gave Jesus? Myrrh? Yeah, myrrh. Myrrh, that's the one. Myrrh's my favorite and I forgot it. Yeah. Yeah, if you're familiar with the scent of myrrh or frankincense, like a lot of the times it's usually along those lines. Okay. Yeah. So now that we're talking about fragrance terminology, I feel like I've semi-learned the difference here, but I'm gonna ask it because I'm sure there are others like me that don't know, didn't know. Um, what is the difference between eau de toilette and eau de parfum? Okay, so 
usually and mainly it is the concentration of fragrance so there are more concentrations than just an eau de parfum and an eau de toilette but it's a higher concentration would be an eau de parfum and a lower concentration of fragrance would be eau de toilette okay right but then a lot of brands also do change the scent profile a little bit like there's chanel fragrances they'll have the same name and the um edp version which is yep. the eau de parfum yep smells very different than the eau de toilette they just they switch up the notes they do tend to have like a little bit of a different smell sometimes so it's not just that it's a weaker or stronger version of the fragrance a lot of the times they do actually like tweak the notes and the scent profile so when you're going for an EDP you're not actually just going for a stronger version of that fragrance you're actually going a little bit for like a different scent breakdown okay yeah so another difference that I do not know and I am sorry that I do not know this what is the difference between a niche fragrance and a designer fragrance? Mmm, okay. So the niche police is gonna come after me for this answer. I use niche more so as a generalized term. I know that a lot of people are very particular when they say niche and they refer to small independent perfumers that create fragrance as almost more of like an artistic craft and they're usually very unique smells. They usually use very um, natural ingredients or rare ingredients, combinations, and like higher quality. A lot of times they're higher quality, but niche has kind of trickled its way over to designer luxury divisions. So there's like the Dior Privé collection. I'm still gonna call it niche. It's expensive and usually niche tends to be a little bit more expensive, but there's now like a designer luxury division and there's also a lot of larger brands that focus only on creating fragrances that I personally still qualify as niche, like the brand Parfums de Marly and Mikalev. You love that uh, oh, Eden do, Falls I too. Do. Yeah, that one's a big hit. Um, those brands, even though they're more famous, um, I still qualify as niche because in my mind and my personal, I guess, definition of niche niche would be a brand that focuses solely on creating fragrances. So whether it's an independent perfumer or a, a bigger brand, if their main market is fragrance, I'm gonna call it niche. Okay. But a lot of people disagree with that. Okay. And then designer is a big company that has fragrance in their repertoire? Exactly. Oh. So like Armani. Armani does clothing, Armani does fragrance, Armani does a lot of things. Same with Guerlain. Guerlain does makeup, a lot, lots of different things. Chanel, those are brands that you see everywhere. Like you see them on like the runway, you see them makeup everywhere, everywhere. And then they also happen to do fragrance. Okay. So yeah. That makes sense. And designer tends to be more mass appealing. So that's the main thing to, the main difference between the, the scent profiles is niche tends to be a little bit more of a, um, like a refined palette kind of thing where like you're like, you have to be into fragrance to probably appreciate niche where designer is usually more mass appealing. Okay. That makes sense. So another question uh, that I was watching one of your videos where you kept talking about flankers and I had no idea what this was. What is a flanker? <laughs> well, to know what a flanker is, you also need to know what a pillar is. Do tell, please. <laughs> so we have flankers, which are basically sequels to a fragrance, right? Okay. So your pillar would be your Toy Story. Okay. And then your flanker would be your Toy Story 2. Okay. So Alien is the pillar. Like you love Alien, so we're I gonna go with Alien. Alien. Yeah. So Alien is the pillar, and that is the main one, and then because that one had been very popular, and like usually pillar fragrances are very popular, they sell well, and then that brand comes out with Flankers. Flankers are like a little bit of a different spin on that same general scent profile, so like the DNA, as they say, mm -hmm. is the same. Okay. So it still borrows from the original scent, but it tweaks it in its own way. So like, you smell my Alien Eau Sublime, and the Essence Absolue, and they all tweak the original Alien DNA, to a little bit something different in its own thing so it makes it worth having all of them and then the brand gets to make lots and lots of money true like angel for me angel is um like one i could it's hit and miss but like eau de croisier and aqua chic amazing like still similar but but for me like the eau croisier like to me doesn't smell at all like the original angel no 
that's just like i think they took the packaging they knew that that like that fragrance sells well and they're like let's put a completely different fragrance but then call it the same thing and yeah. people will buy it and they did and they do and they will continue to okay so second last question for you what exactly is an animalic note ah so an animalic note usually is derived from some kind of animal product and they don't always come from an animal so there are some that actually come from the animal and a lot of it is like cannot be cruelty free but sometimes it can but it's usually gross regardless mm -hmm. a lot of it comes from glands yep beavers uh civet like little animals that secrete an odor that people then collect and use it in fragrance which blows my mind but there's a lot of different ones and sometimes it's like animal spit it comes from nests it comes and a lot of this by the way is like no longer are you allowed to do this and it's all synthesized okay but back in the day when people used to use naturals like they would get these products naturally and i think some brands still do but anyway yeah so you have soft ones like musk that come from the musk deer that have this like some of it is okay i've never smelled black musk on its own i don't know what it smells like but white musk is this like clean smell it's almost like soapy clean smell okay yeah um now it's all synthetic but anyway like musk originally comes from an animal and then civet has this like um civet cat sprays uh, uh, thing yeah and that spray has an odor that like helps florals really like shine in a fragrance but it smells kind of dank on its own uh -huh. and then ambergris is a uh, spit from a sperm whale that solidifies and like there's these all these crazy things that people are like ooh, I wonder what this would smell like if I just put this on my body but yeah that is what animalic things are they are derived from some kind of animal product and it is usually not cruelty free and it is usually pretty gross um imo so i'm glad that there is actually a ban on that yes oh i agree mm -hmm. Ooh. would leather count as an animalic now i think leather does count but leather is synthetic and like you wouldn't actually like use a leather and like squeeze leather to put leather juice in your fragrance yes yeah. it's, it's i i don't know if leather has always been synthetic i think leather does qualify as an animalic note because it smells animal like so a lot of animalic notes they smell animal like okay. so I, I would say leather qualifies but it's a wearable animalic note then i'm pretty sure it's like always synthetic and last question and this is a yana specific fragrance question what is the difference between nose holes and nosicles mm. Well, I don't think these guys have heard me say nosicles. I think that's been for you only. I feel yeah. so honored. <laughs> nosicles has been for Julie only. Um, well, no, neither of these words I don't think are real words, but they're my words. And so... We'll, Therefore, they're real. They're real on this channel. Yeah. Nose holes are exactly what they sound like. They are the holes in your nose through which the passage of fragrance goes. And the nosicles, as I like to imagine, are like these little sensors in your nose that pick up the fragrance. Oh, yes. Yeah, so your nosicles actually are doing the work. Your nose holes are just the, the vessel through which fragrance travels. I don't know if the world is ready for nosicles yet, but we're, we're doing nose holes for now. <laughs> One video at a time. <laughs> so yeah. those are all my newbie questions for today. Thank you, those were all amazing. If you guys have any sort of fragrance questions, whether newbie or not newbie, please leave a comment down below with your questions and we'll do another video. I think this is super fun, we all get to learn. And if I don't know an answer to one of your questions, I'll do research, which is also super fun. Mm -hmm. So yeah, leave those questions and we'll get them answered. And I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you found it helpful and fun. Please give this video a big thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you guys haven't already, and we'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching. Bye. Bye.